Through all life's sorrows and despairs, I will not be moved. When facing death, I need not fear. I have this hope secure. Because Christ died at Calvary, sin has on me no claim. Because he overcame the grave, with him I will be raised. Eternity is one for me by 
is one for me by hands eternal sings his praise for by his word all things were made he holds the keys to life and death sustains us by his very breath stars and galaxies were made for the glory of his name Earth and heaven declare his ways O Christ the matchless King be praised Jesus is the Lord of all Jesus is the Lord of all You're the one we bow before Jesus is the Lord of all
Place I hope and trust in you There is no other So sure and steady My hope is held in your hand When castles crumble And breath is fleeting Upon this rock I will stand Upon this rock I will stand Glory, glory We have no other king But Jesus, Lord of all We raise the anthem Well, welcome everybody to our Monday evening celebration. It's great to see you all with us, whether that's here on site or if it's at the Keswick Methodist Church or whether you're watching from home, everybody is welcome. Now, I have some good news and I have some bad news this evening. The good news, well, really good news, is that Martin's going to be bringing God's word to us later. But so the bad news is he's not standing next to me this evening to basically translate for anyone who doesn't understand my accent so I apologize in advance maybe we should have subtitles up for this evening so you kind of understand what I'm saying but on that note let's see where everyone's from so if you're from Scotland maybe give us a wave or give us oh got a fair few if you're from Northern Ireland Give us a wave. Not many, maybe still a difficulty to travel. Oh, we've got one, that's great. And how about Northern England, those Northerners? Great, so we've got some that will understand me. And how about down south? Where's our Southerners? Brilliant. And international, do we have international people here? Maybe online? You're all very welcome. What? Wales, how can I forget? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please just give me a big wave, Wales. I do love Wales. Love it. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm not going anymore. I'm not, we're running out of time here. Right. So we have had some brilliant messages in. So thank you to all those who've been sharing messages with us through our website or on social media. So the first message we have comes from an 83-year-old lady. Listen to this. I am 83 and never realized Keswick Convention was going strong. My father and another elder from our church went every year in the 1970s and always brought back wonderful reports. And this lady has accessed YouTube. And when she got signed up to YouTube, Keswick Ministries popped up. And she realized that she could access us and she's been watching online. How great is that? You're welcome to join us. And then we're now gonna see where our brilliant Mick has been. There he is. So Mick has been to the lake today and he is actually um, the mascot of Crossway's campsite. So thank you guys for placing him and taking him to different places across Keswick. Let's see where he'll end up tomorrow, but it's great to have him with us, isn't it? Okay, so as we prepare our hearts for worship, I just want to read to you now Psalms 34. I will bless the Lord 
at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make boast to the Lord. Let the humble hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let's stand now with our band as they lead us in worship.
ultimate display of the faithfulness of our God. We praise you and we give our lives to you in worship in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Let's take our seats. Good evening, everybody. I'm often asked, oh, what's your favorite book? Well, there are different books for different times and seasons, and so I have uh, favourites for different periods. But over the last, uh, I don't know, three, four, five years perhaps, I think this is the, the best book I've read uh, by quite some distance. It's by Ed Welch. It's called Created to Draw Near. And Ed takes us on a journey right the way through Scripture, from Genesis through to Revelation, and looks at our relationship with God. We are designed, we're made by him to be in relationship with him, to be his royal priesthood. And he makes the first move. He draws near to us so that we might draw near to him. And he traces this right the way through Scripture. As I say, I, uh, I have the habit of marking and underlining and folding over. If you're one of those people that are precious about your books, you'd really hate me. I fold it and mark it. And I, every page, there's something that I've marked or starred that I wanted to meditate on and chew over. If you want a really excellent book that's going to help you get a grasp of, of this whole theme of our relationship with God because he made the first move, I, I really commend this to you. Seriously, miss a Greg's pasty tomorrow if money's tight. Forgo that and buy this. You will not be disappointed. And if you are disappointed, write to me and I will send you a Greg's pasty, okay? So that, that's the deal. I really commend this to you. Now, when I, was, um, when I was young and I was playing cricket, my cricket coach would always say, Jonathan, Make sure your eyes are on the wickets right the way uh, through your bowling action because when you take a wicket, you want to see it. It's going to be so rare that, you, that, that it happens that you want to see it. But it's a good principle. We need our eyes on the prize and we can be so quickly distracted. We can take our eyes off our, our final destination, where we're going in the Christian life and we can get really wrapped up in our day-to-day -day lives and, and miss the glory that is before us. And in a little book uh, called Breathtaking Glory, Tom Robson has really tried to help us take our eyes from, from the circumstances and situation we find ourselves in day-to-day -day and 
and lift them towards Christ. And this is a, a little book that's going to help us fix our eyes on the person of Christ, be, be as it were, have our breath taken away by his glory and, and keep our eyes on the prize of what's ahead. Now, um, up, up on the screen it says three pounds. I'm, I'm going to scrap that because I want you to get this. As you leave tonight, whether it's from here or at the relay tent, you can have it for a pound, okay? There'll be buckets at the exits. Have it for a pound. If you're up at the Methodist Church, I'm really sorry, but if you run down, you can have it. If not, you can get it tomorrow. But two books I'd love you to get because I think they're going to help us see our relationship with God differently and help us to keep our eyes on where we're going till one day we see him face to face. Thanks. I've been coming to the convention for years and I've always wondered what it's like for the person who has to follow Jonathan up on stage. <laughs> it's wonderful though to spend a moment with you now just um, thinking about the Derwent Project. Now the Derwent Project, as you, as you know, is a vision that was cast back in 2010 when the then convention trustees asked whether it would be possible to extend the ministry of the convention throughout the year. And that became a possibility in 2015 with the purchase of this site, which are next to the Rawnsley site just next door to provide one site for the convention. Now what the convention does, of course, is that it brings us to the Lake District every year in the summer where we're refreshed by this fantastic town in the middle of the Lake District, surrounded by God's creation, and we're inspired by great Bible teaching and then equipped to return home to our places of work, our communities, or on mission, wherever God's called us, to love and live for Christ in his world. Now, the Derwent Project allows us to secure the future of the convention by bringing the convention all together onto this one site, all one in Christ Jesus. And as you remember, that's the banner that used to hang in Skiddle Street, and here it is with us now. But of course, we're not here to worship a banner, we're here to worship Jesus Christ, both as children of God, but also for our children and our grandchildren to grow in his word just next door in the wonderful pencil factory. But of course, with the Derwent Project, we can do more than that now throughout the year. And our teaching and training course is in full flow. That's been going now for a couple of years and there are events throughout the year and there's something for everyone, something for everyone in this room now and out there online. So I really would encourage you to go online, look at the program, and see what's there for you to return to Keswick at another time of the year to grow in the word. Now tomorrow morning, James Robson, our ministry director, is going to talk more about that at, at the uh, Bible reading tomorrow morning. And then tomorrow afternoon, there's, at 2.30, there's a session in the pencil factory on our teaching and training events throughout the year. So do think about going to that. I think you'll be really encouraged and really excited about the courses that are on offer that may well suit you uh, and help you grow in the Lord. But of course, the Derwent Project allows us to do even more than that. And one of the exciting initiatives we've just launched is the Church Weekends Away. There are two dates in 2022 and the second one in 2023. And again, something that I think you'd be really interested in. It's designed for small churches or groups of people from larger churches who don't want all the faff of organizing a church weekend, but want to go somewhere special and be enriched by it, well, come to Keswick. We're all going to organize a church weekend for you. There'll be a fantastic worship band to, to lead our sung worship and rich Bible teaching, and then time for you to break out, be together, or, or to have fellowship with the other groups that are there. But of course, to do all this means we need a facility, and that's where the pencil factory building comes in. And as you can see, there it is in 2015 on the right of the screen, as it looked like when, when it came uh, into the Keswick Convention's uh, uh, remit. It, it's dilapidated, Hurricane Desmond has swept through it, there's been some vandals in and the windows got broken. And there it is on the left of the screen, as we've seen it every day this week as we walk past it, restored. The front fascia re-rendered and insulated and new windows, and the first floor marvelously completed just two days before the convention with meeting rooms and those wonderful toilets that I hope you're all enjoying this week. <laughs> but there's more work to be done. 
Um, on the first and second floors, they still need to be refurbished. And outside at the back, if you sneak a look around there, you'll see that that still needs to be rendered and the new windows put in. And that's going to cost round about £600,000 to ensure that it's ready for next year's convention. So I would ask you to prayerfully consider whether you could help us with that. Now, on your seats this morning, and just as you go out, there's a brochure which has all the details of the Derwent project and how you might partner with us in prayer and in giving. And um, that would be a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, to have that space ready for next year so that all the children and youth activity could be inside that building. Now, we've got a little video to share with you. Um, quite hot off the press, it hasn't been seen uh, by many, many times yet. It introduced you to some of the people who have been involved with the project from the start and demonstrates a little of the progress that's taken place. For 145 years, Keswick Ministries has served the wider church, inspiring Christians from all over the world in their walk with Christ. A few years back, the trustees cast a vision for what we now know as the Derwent Project with the aim to transform this derelict site. It is wonderful to see the progress the Derwent Project is making. The building itself is looking really good and parts of it are already being used for a number of activities. In fact, last year, Emu Music played here. It's especially encouraging to me to see how the vision is becoming a reality today. I'm really excited that even last year, children and youth were able to start to use part of the pencil factory for their program. What an answer to prayer. And it's been fantastic to see all of that begin to happen. I can't wait to see the site packed with Christians from all ages and all walks of life coming together to celebrate the God-given vision, to hear God's word, to become like God's son and to serve God's mission. Over the last year, the Derwent project has made great progress. Phase one of the refurbishment to the pencil factory building is complete. This involved the rendering, painting, and new windows on the front fascia, installation of toilets for use during the convention, heating, lighting, and plumbing, and the creation of meeting spaces on the ground floor that this year will be used for the convention's youth program. Over the last five years, what was a vision back then is becoming a reality. It's been incredibly exciting to see. So what was a derelict site is now becoming a striking conference center available for use. But it's not about a building, it's about transformed lives. And it's incredibly exciting this year for the first time in Keswick's 145 year history to have the convention on this one site. We ran a preaching workshop just in October while it was still allowed and we had uh, 10 young preachers coming and the person running the workshop said in that room were 40,000 sermons so a chance to invest in a few for the sake of the many. One thing that really excites me is working with young leaders as part of the youth team. It's just great to see people coming along and getting involved, stepping out and investing in these kids and realising that they can do it, that with God's help they can play their part in seeing lives changed. Of course they go home uh, equipped with new gifts and skills that they can use back in their home churches. The Derwent project has such potential to touch so many more lives and for some that might mean following in the footsteps of folk like Amy Carmichael and Hudson Taylor for whom the convention played a significant part in them taking the gospel to thousands abroad. The opportunities are endless. The progress has only been possible through the continued and generous financial support of so many. We have reached numerous milestones and are now about to reach yet one more, which will see the first and second floors of the building completed. In order to reach this next milestone, we will need to raise £600,000 before we can continue. So would you consider making a donation of £50 or £100 or maybe even a larger gift towards the project to help us reach this goal? Or maybe you would consider giving a smaller amount on a monthly basis? Each and every gift makes a difference and takes us closer to the point where this and the next generation can enjoy this beacon of spiritual refreshment, a refreshment we all need so much. 
thank you. Well, you can find out more on one of our tours of the pencil factory that we're doing every afternoon at 1.30 and 3.30. You can book those on the VKC website. Just go to the other events on the week on the website, week two other events. You'll find the booking there. Uh, if you're really good, uh, I can get you up onto the roof as well, and we can look down over Keswick and the surrounding mountains as part of that tour. So something really to really look forward to. So do join one of those tours. And do remember the teaching and training uh, update, which will be at 2.30 in the Pencil Factory building tomorrow with James Robson. But he'll tell you more about that tomorrow morning. And lastly, this has been a wonderful um, a journey of faith, as John Risbridger said. Uh, at the start of the project, we weren't sure exactly how to get to this point we are now. Wonderful that we're on one site. Thanks to the generosity of God's people. And we just love you to continue that journey with us. Thank you. It is so exciting to see what God is doing here, isn't it? And just to see the development of this site over um, the number of years that we've been here at Keswick and just particularly over the past few weeks getting this site ready for us to be here. So the team have worked tirelessly and we, we thank them. And mostly we thank God for what he's given us and be able to meet here freely to worship him. So please do consider, prayerfully consider how you can support the Derwent Project. That'd be brilliant. Right, a few notices. So how great are the band being, by the way? So tomorrow, yes, so tomorrow night... At 9.15, Ben and the band are gonna, um, we're gonna have a concert together. You don't have to book for this. You just turn up after our evening celebration. That's tomorrow evening at 9.15. Also, we're holding this year an event for mission families. So this is gonna be taking place um, on Wednesday, two till four in Base Camp Cafe, just through there. And this is really for families who've got family members who are serving on mission. It's to offer additional support to those families and to pray with you. So please do join us on Wednesday between two and four o'clock. And then two more notices, just to remind you that throughout this week, the youth meeting ends at 9 p.m. So parents, you don't have to dash off before this meeting ends. And the last notice is, if you're heading to the seminars this week, please do download the notes before you go to the pencil factory because there's no Wi-Fi there. So if you turn up without your notes, you'll be a bit gutted. So please do download them before you arrive so you have them at hand for all our seminars that are taking place. So now the band are gonna continue to lead some worship before we have our Bible reading and then we hear God's word being preached. Shall we stand together? Sing, come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing your grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise his name I fixed upon Name of God's redeeming love. Hitherto your love has blessed me. You have brought me to this place. And I know your hand will lead me safely on by. Sovereign grace, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, brought me with him. 
what a day that will be when we are freed from sinning. Can you imagine the joy of that day? And the truth is the Lord knows that we're prone to wander. He knows the way in which our hearts are, are pulled, pulled by the world, pulled by our own desires. He knows that we're like sheep that, that go astray, that each of us has turned to our own way. And yet, and yet, it is the character of our God that he is faithful to forgive. That's who he is. And he still faithfully offers forgiveness to all those who come to him and call on his name. So we are going to pray together now to confess to the Lord our sin and to receive again his forgiveness that he will offer us because of Jesus and all that he's done. Let's pray these words together. We pray, Father God, you have commanded us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and to love other people as much as we love ourselves. But we have not loved you or other people as we should. We have said and done things that are wrong. But because you love us, you sent Jesus to die on the cross, to be punished instead of us. So because of Jesus, we ask you to forgive us for the wrong things we have done. Please help us to know that through Jesus, you are not angry with us. And please help us to live more and more how you want us to live. Amen. God's word says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But listen to this promise of God's word, the promise of our faithful God. He says, if we confess our sins as we have, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Father, we, we claim that promise in the name of your son today that having confessed our sins to you, we can be assured of your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That as he died upon the cross, he died for our sins. As he rose from the dead, so we will rise to newness of life in him. And we give you thanks that we no longer live in shame, or fear, but we stand completely forgiven, washed clean, and certain, Father, that we will not remain in the grave, but we will share in your victory for all eternity, because, and on the basis of your great faithfulness to your word, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate that victory now.
through having Jesus because of his faithfulness. Praise him. Let's take our seats. Well, we're very glad at Keswick that we work with lots of local churches. And this evening, we've got with us Kevin Roy, who's from Castle Sowerby Chapel, who will be bringing our Bible reading to us this evening. But before Kevin reads to us, we're just going to commit tonight to prayer. Lord God, you come to you now and we pray that you will just awaken our hearts and our minds to hear your words being preached. We pray that you will change us and transform us through your word. We pray that you'll make us more Christ-like. Lord, we know that you love us, you died for us. And Lord, we thank you for your salvation. And Lord, I pray tonight that we'll be awestruck yet again by the truth of the gospel. So we pray now that you will just soften our minds, like remove all distractions away and help us to fully focus on what you have to say to each one of us tonight. We pray these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Okay. I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1 verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Thus far the reading of God's word. Well, I was uh, eight years old when uh, my mate at school, Dan Jones, told me that uh, his dad was mates with Gary Lineker. I, I couldn't believe it. If, if you don't know who Gary Lineker is, uh, he used to play kickball back in the day. He was uh, kind of one of the heroes of the World Cups, Mexico 86, and Italia 90. Uh, and my mate's dad was mates with Gary Lineker. And, and so I said to my mate, can you get me his autograph? And he said he would. A few days later, I said, have you, have you got me his autograph? And, and he said, oh, no, he's not, he's not seen him yet, but he's seen him soon. And so a few days later, I asked again, and, and a few days later again, and, and a few weeks passed, and it, and it still wasn't there. And eventually, after I kind of nagged him and nagged him and nagged him, the great day came when my mate Dan Jones came in to school holding this little kind of scrap of paper, and he, and he gave it to me. And sure enough, there it was. It said, Dear Martin, best wishes, Gary Lineker. Oh, so I was like, this was, we don't believe in the Holy Grail, but, but this was like the Holy Grail to me. 
This thing was amazing and I, and I looked at it and I, I couldn't quite believe that it was real and, and I looked at it a, a bit longer and, and well, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, Gary Lineker's got the same handwriting as my mate Dan Jones. <laughs> bit of a coincidence. I don't know if you've ever been let down by somebody. I guess, Dan, it was one of those things, wasn't it? A tall tale got a bit out of hand. We kind of understand it, but most of us know what it means to be failed by somebody actually much more seriously, don't we? Maybe a, a friend betrayed a confidence. Maybe a boss treated you really badly. Maybe the doctor missed something really important they should have seen. Maybe a parent just wasn't what they could or should have been. Maybe a spouse didn't keep the promises they made to you. Maybe a church leader has failed you badly. There are many ways, aren't there, that... um, People and things in this world let us down. Many ways in which things and people in this world can fail us. But what I want you to see tonight is that the word of God is not one of those things. Verse 37 is our kind of key verse this evening. If you've got a Bible, look down. Can you see it? As the angel Gabriel finishes his announcement, he says to Mary, for no word from God will ever fail. The word of God never fails the people of God. And as we think about that this evening, I want us to to get into that from sort of a couple of angles, uh, to to think about particularly what Gabriel is is announcing or is talking about. Uh, And so I've got kind of two headings for us this evening. I I sent these two headings to uh, to, Teresa, who's the wonderful person that runs the production team at the back. If you see any of the people in black tops, do thank them. They do an amazing job through the week looking after us. And I sent her these headings, and she sent an email back saying, two headings? Are you sure that's biblical? Um, So it is just two, not three, just two. And these are the two things I want us to see this evening. Here's the first one. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. He's the saviour. So have a look down with me. Uh, Here's what's happening. Uh, In the sixth month, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel gives her this this announcement of this this special baby she is to miraculously bear. Now, just a few things I want us to kind of notice as we we think about this first heading. Notice it's it's that announcement of a miraculous birth. Felix helped us with this last night, didn't he? Throughout the Old Testament, there are a number of those announcements of miraculous births. It was Abraham and and Sarah with Isaac, and Isaac and Rebecca with Jacob, and and Jacob and Rachel with Joseph. It was uh, Hannah with the prophet Samuel. It was uh, the the great judge and saviour Samson. They're all miracle births. And whenever you see one of those kind of miracle babies, as Felix showed us last night, they are they're important in the great salvific purposes of God as he works them out through history. It's a miracle baby, that's important. And his name, well, Gabriel tells her, doesn't he? Verse um, 31, uh, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. Now, many of you will already know what that name means, but if you don't, Jesus is kind of the Greek, the New Testament version of the Old Testament name Joshua. And Joshua means, effectively, God saves. Uh, This baby's name is going to mean saviour. He's a miracle. His name means saviour. But here's the really interesting thing for me. We're told the name of the angel that came to Mary. That's quite unusual. And the angel's name is Gabriel. And as soon as I read that, I started thinking, where where else do we see Gabriel in the Bible? There's only two places Gabriel appears in the entire Bible. One of those is here in Luke 1 and 2, the announcements to Zechariah and Mary. And the other place is in the book of Daniel. Uh, Chapters 8 
and 9. And in the book of Daniel, um, basically Daniel is having this, this vision of these, these great forces of evil which arise to, to threaten God's people. Uh, and God's promise through the angel is that ultimately God would overcome all of that evil. And in Daniel 9, here's what Gabriel says. Uh, to Daniel, verse 24 of Daniel 9, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there'll be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now, there's a whole load of debate about exactly what, what the numbers refer to. In my preparation, I emailed the, um, the very reverend Dr. James Robson, who's an Old Testament scholar, and I said, James, any, any idea on what Daniel 9 means? And he emailed me back and said, not a clue. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can ask me afterwards. I, I do have a view on it. Uh, if you really want to know, I'll tell you. Um, but, but don't miss the main thing. Here is Gabriel saying, there will come a time when transgression will be done, when sin will be covered, when atonement for wickedness will be made, when everlasting righteousness will come in, when the anointed one comes. And here is that same Gabriel appearing to this teenage girl, Mary, saying, this is it. This is the moment. This is the time when, when sin is going to be atoned for. Wickedness dealt with, transgression finished, everlasting righteousness brought in. The anointed one is here. The saviour, the deliverer. And the rest of Luke's story is going to tell us exactly how he is going to conquer evil. Ultimately, we know that it will be as he goes on his way towards Jerusalem, ultimately to a death on the cross as he pays the penalty for sin, the penalty you and I rightly deserve for the ways in which we've, we've pushed God away, held my arm's length, rebelled against him. Jesus is going to come and atone for all of that. He's the saviour. I, I don't know about you, I need to remind myself of this stuff regularly and often. And here's why, and maybe you're a bit like me, maybe you're a bit like me in this, I think sometimes we can fall into this trap of thinking, especially if you've been a Christian a while, you can sit there and think, yeah, Gospels, Jesus, cross, yeah, I've got all that, I, I know all that, can we, can we talk about something interesting, please? Like what the 77s mean in Daniel 9. Like, like the, 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 the cross and the saviour, and that's kind of like Christianity 101, but, but let's move on. No, let's not move on. I need to be, rem to be reminded often that Jesus has delivered me from my sin. Here's why. I want to show you why. Um, see if your brain works uh, anything like this. Here's, think of this as your, your kind of approval rating with God. Okay? Bottom, low approval rating with God. Top, high approval rating with God. And if you're anything like me, you think of it in these terms. You think, well... I did my quiet time today, so I'm probably all right. And they think, oh, but, but I just, I lost it with the kids. I, I lost my temper. I shouted. I said, maybe it's down here. But then you think, but, but, but I was on a short-term mission team, and we, we went to the other side of the world, and we, we did good, and we cared. So, so maybe this is what God thinks of me. And then you think, oh, but, but I swore at that guy that cut me up on the M6 on the way to Keswick. Oh. But then I, I serve at my local church and, and I serve in a ministry team and I, I give financially to support the work so maybe, maybe God's happy with me. But then I just can't seem to beat this ongoing pattern, this, this sin in my life that I just can't seem to get past and, and every time I fall into it, I'm back down here. But then I think, I bet God really likes me because I go to the Keswick Convention every year. <laughs> but then maybe I remember that there's something in my past that I'm just so deeply ashamed of. 
that I think, I, although I believe God can, can accept me because of Jesus, does he ever really like me? And we need to remember that Jesus is the saviour. That he has delivered me from the penalty of sin. We need to take all of this, this kind of way of thinking about stuff and remember Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left this crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. He has delivered me from sin. I need to remind myself of that because I keep falling into that way of thinking that God's approval of me is based on my performance, not what he has won for me at the cross. He has delivered me. And more than he has delivered me, actually the saviour, he, he is delivering me. I, uh, I, I, I pinched this earlier. When I say pinched, I don't mean I stole it. Uh, it, it, it was permitted, it was where we were having lunch, um, and, and, and I picked up one of these. Every day they provide us a little bit of lunch, and, uh, and, and check, check this out. Check out this, can you, can you see that? Look at, look, at, look, look at the size of that. You could build houses with this thing. That's a millionaire shortbread, it's the biggest one I've ever seen. It must be about 800 calories. <laughs> and I saw it and I thought, oh, the spirit was willing but the flesh was weak. So I fancy that. So I've taken it. I'd love to share it, but COVID, what can I say? That's for me afterwards. <laughs> Jesus has delivered me. He is delivering me. As the work of his Holy Spirit in my life today is transforming me more and more and more into the likeness of Jesus. It's a, it's a long journey, isn't it? It's a lifelong journey, and there are points on that journey where it feels particularly difficult, but he is delivering me from the power of sin in my life. And more than that, he will deliver me from sin and all the forces of evil at work in our world. He has delivered me from the penalty for my sin. He is delivering me from the power of my sin. He will deliver me from the presence of my sin. You see, we need to know this, don't we, that, that when Jesus comes to be the saviour, it's not just a sort of a, an individualistic saving of souls. It's not just that on the cross what he's doing is sort of giving you a ticket to the sky when you die. It's not, I, I pray the prayer, I've got the ticket, I'll sit tight and wait for heaven. No, when, when Jesus comes to be the saviour, when he conquers all the forces of hell on the cross, he's ushering in nothing less than new creation. It has already begun in your hearts and mine. His kingdom is growing. One day there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, but now we, we grow. That's what Romans 8 tells us, isn't it? Paul says in Romans 8, all of creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Verse 23, not only so, but, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. But he will deliver us. The Saviour will deliver us. I um, Before coming here, I visited a lady on um, Friday morning. And uh, she's 91 years old. And uh, <clears throat> tragically, her, her daughter, who also comes to our church, she, she was in her late 50s. And uh, on, on Tuesday, over the, the previous weekend, she'd been feeling quite unwell. She wasn't feeling great. Uh, uh, her husband left her to go to the station to pick up her daughter. And when the, the daughter and the husband returned home, they found this lady in her late 50s dead on the couch. Another friend, as, as we were leaving, the morning we were leaving to come to Keswick, her mum, she, she said her mum earlier in the week had, had had a massive stroke, a massive bleed onto the brain. And she, she WhatsApped a whole load of us that morning to say, I just wanted to let you know that my mum went home in the early hours of the morning. See, the, the tragedies, the, the suffering, the pain, the, the injustice, all that we see around us on our news feeds, all of that one day, Jesus will deliver us from those two. Richard Baxter, the old Christian minister and writer, once wrote this, a gale of groans and a stream of tears 
accompany us to the very gates of heaven. But there they bid us farewell forever. Turn your eyes on Jesus. He's the saviour. He he has delivered us from the penalty of our sin. He is delivering us from the power of our sin. One day he'll deliver us from the presence of sin altogether. May we never lose the wonder of that. May we never think of that as basic Christianity. Christianity 101, let's do something more interesting. No, this is the most interesting stuff. This is the most life-changing, world-transforming stuff. May we never... May we pray that God would never take away the wonder of what it means for Jesus to be the Saviour. And I don't want to presume that all of you here, whether you're you're with us or whether you're watching online, I don't want to presume that all of you necessarily believe all this at the moment. Some of you have maybe been brought along with somebody. Uh, Maybe maybe somebody sent you this talk online and you're, you're kind of watching it, trying to find out a bit more about Jesus. You wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian. Let me encourage you to really look closely, to really turn your eyes to Jesus. to to maybe read a gospel or or read a little book, maybe ask a friend to talk more about these things. Find out more about everything that it means for Jesus to be the saviour because he will meet all of your deepest dreams, hopes, aspirations and needs. He offers life to the full now and into eternity. Maybe you're somebody who's who's been looking into this for a while and you've sat on the fence and it's time to get down. And to turn your eyes to Jesus and effectively do what the the thief on the cross did when he's been crucified next to Jesus. He said, Jesus, could you remember someone like me? And Jesus said to him, what? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. You 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 don't do anything special or weird to do that. You can do that sat right where you are as you listen to me talk. You can just say to Lord Jesus, you say, Jesus, I turn my eyes to you. Can you be my saviour? And he promises he will. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Come to Jesus again. He's the saviour. Here's the second heading. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. He's the king. He's the king. Look, at, look again at what we're told, some of the little details here. Where does Gabriel go? He goes to a place called Galilee. And he goes to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And look at some of the things that um, Gabriel announces. He says, you'll give birth to a son, verse 31, you call him Jesus. He'll be great and will be called son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over Jacob uh, and his descendants forever and his kingdom will never end. A virgin in Galilee David and his throne. I can't help but my mind go back to Isaiah 7 to 9. And Jeremy helped us think about this on Saturday night. It just here's some words, Isaiah 7. That great prophecy that the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And here's Isaiah 9, there's this great promise that in the future God will honour, where? Galilee, of the nations, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called. Wonderful counsellor, mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Do you hear the echoes of what Gabriel brings to Mary, this this special child that will be this, this incredible universal king? I don't know what you make of kings in our culture. I'm not asking whether you're a royalist or a republican, but, but I don't think the, <clears throat> the idea of kings carries much traction for us, does it? In our culture, kings are generally considered uh, mad, bad, or trad. You, you get the mad kings like kind of King Louis in the Jungle Book. He's bonkers, isn't he? He's an orangutan who thinks he's a king. 
Or there's King Midas, who everything he touches turns to gold, including his own daughter. He's an idiot. Or there's, there's bad kings. I mean, pick any century you like. Kings like Nebuchadnezzar. Kings like Herod, who use their power for evil ends. Well, there's kind of trad kings, isn't there? There's the ceremonial title, but really that, that person has no real power of governance over their subjects. You see, for a king, a king to be really worth something, they need three things, I think. They need knowledge, they need goodness, and they need power. Any, if you lose any one of those three things, you haven't really got a brilliant king. Without knowledge, well... How will they know what their subjects really need? Without goodness, well, then you've got knowledge and power, but, but aimed toward evil ends. And without power, well, you've got goodness and knowledge, but really the, the inability to do much at all. You see, you need all three of those qualities, and here is a king. Here is how does Isaiah describe him? Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, knowledge, goodness, and power. Incidentally, I, um, I, I came across this, this little uh, dictum, I suppose, recently, um, which I thought was, was quite nice. It's called um, Hanlon's Razor. You may have heard of Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor is the idea that, I, I think, uh, the simplest explanation is normally the right one. Hanlon's Razor says this says, never attribute to malice what is better explained by stupidity. I quite like that. I think that would explain quite a lot, wouldn't it, in our lives. I think our society would be much kinder and more gracious if we, we kind of employed that a bit more. Um, but here is a king. Here is Jesus the king who is perfect in knowledge and goodness and power, the one of whom the title king is truly Worthy. I don't know about you, but I think our world desperately needs a saviour and a king like this, doesn't it? It's a great need. A survey was done uh, five years ago uh, among 2,000 young people aged between 11 to 18. Uh, it was done by the Barna Group. And, and in this poll, they were asking about who, who they thought Jesus was. Do you know, uh, only... 54% of those surveyed thought Jesus was an actual person who actually lived and walked the face of the earth. That means almost half of young people are not even sure Jesus was real. Of the ones that do think he really existed, less than a third of them believe that he was the sorts of things he claimed to be. That's like eight or nine in every 10 young people in our nation have no idea of this Jesus who is saviour and king who can meet all of our deepest hopes, needs and aspirations. I've got some new favourite literary characters. I don't, do, you like, do you like reading C.S. Lewis? Anybody like the Narnia Chronicles? Any fans? Um, I'm not sure which one my favourite is but, but one that I really love is The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And in that book, um, they come to an island and they discover a sort of an estate. The estate is ruled over by a, a powerful magician. And his subjects uh, are these rather wonderful little characters uh, that go by the name of Duffelpuds. They're called Duffelpuds. And the Duffelpuds are not really sure they trust the magician. They're not sure that his rule is good at all. And so whatever he says to them, they decide to do something different because they're suspicious. Eventually, one of the, uh, the children meets the magician and asks about these, these duffel puds. And, uh, and the magician says this. He says, you won't believe the troubles I've had with them. A few months ago, they were all for washing up the plates and knives before dinner to save time afterwards. I've caught them planting boiled potatoes to save cooking them when they dig them up. One day a cat got into the dairy and 20 of them were at work moving all the milk out. No one thought to move the cat. I think we live in a society of duffelpuds. I think we live in a world 
where people would try and wash up before dinner to save time afterwards. We live in a world that is so lost and confused about the meaning of life, our purpose, where we've come from, where we're going, what the deepest problems are and where the solutions are to be found. We live in a society that needs to know that there is this awesome saviour and king. We need to know it, don't we? Don't we need to know Jesus is on the throne today? We've just been through a year of a global pandemic. We need to know there's a king on the throne who has knowledge, goodness and power. As we look around our world at the injustices, we need to know there's a king that sees that and knows what to do with that. We look at our environment and the ways in which we seem to be tearing it to bits. It does strike me as odd that the people who really don't know God seem to care more about his world than the Christians. We need to know there's a king when those relationships break down, when the spouse breaks their promise to you or when you are that spouse that's broken promises. We need to know there's a king that can somehow bring good out of evil. When we lose our jobs or our businesses, or as Tim said this morning, when we get that that shattering diagnosis. Maybe some of you even here tonight think, if you were a betting person, which you're not, I know, Uh, The odds would be that you probably wouldn't be here next year. We need to know there's a king. A king who knows us. A king who loves us. A king who is good. A king who has power. We need to know, Romans 8, 28, don't we? That God works for the good. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, he's the saviour. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, he's the king. As we sort of draw in towards the finish, I can't help but just, it's just worth noting the recipient of this, isn't it? And her response. Isn't it it wonderful we get in Luke 1 and 2 these kind of contrasting stories? Zechariah and Mary. What do we know about Mary? Not much. She's, She's probably, if Mary were with us tonight, she'd probably be over there in the youth tent. She's probably, what, 14, maybe? She's from Galilee. In the first century Jewish world, Galilee was not particularly highly thought of by those in the south. Not many things changed, do they? (laughs) But here's this this teenage girl, Zechariah, the the priest in the temple, in the line of Aaron in Jerusalem. He's like, Gabriel, I've just got a few questions about this. And here's Mary. Mary the teenager from Galilee, who hears this this mind-blowingly astonishing word that she's going to have this this saviour king baby who will reign on David's throne forever. And she says, I'm your servant. May it be. She believes what Gabriel says in verse 37. What does Gabriel say when he's announced these, these astonishing things for no word from God will ever fail. Many things fail us, many things let us down. The word of God is not one of them. I grew up in the, um, the 80s and um, just, just raise your hand if you own a Skoda. Just, um, just forgive me, brothers and sisters, but I grew up in the, uh, the 80s. I know Skoda is now under new ownership, but in the 80s, Skodas were not reliable cars. Uh, they, were, they were known for, for being unreliable. I know it's different today. Uh, we used to have jokes, didn't we? Uh, let, let me try some... Uh, I, I'll give, I'll give the, uh, the joke. You see if you know the punchline. Uh, play along. Uh, why do Skodas have heated rear windscreens to keep your hands warm while you're pushing it? <laughs> Somebody asks, have you got a wing mirror for a Skoda? Okay, seems like a fair swap. Taking a bit longer for some of you. Um, what do you call a Skoda with a sunroof? Very good, a skip. 
Uh, how do you triple the value of a Skoda? Very good, fill up the tank. Uh, <laughs> the Word of God is not like a 1980s Skoda. It is more like a Japanese train. Japanese trains are amazing. Do you know the, the average delay on a Japanese rail service is just 54 seconds. Can you imagine a world in which that was possible? <laughs> you know, if, if they are, if, if a Japanese train is even five minutes late, the conductor on the train will give every person on there a note that they can hand to their boss to explain why they are so unacceptably late. The word of God is like a Japanese train. It, it always delivers. It never fails. In our garden at home, uh, we live quite near a, a river <clears throat> and uh, we, we get quite a number of birds in around the garden. We've got one, uh, one big, fat, stupid pigeon, which uh, I've taken to naming Donald. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking, joking. I've called him Boris. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, no, no, no. No, I'm going to get punched on the way out. Um, I am joking. Uh, but this big, fat, stupid pigeon, he, he likes to come and try and land in, uh, in the branches of one of the, the, the little saplings in our, in our garden. This tiny, thin little branch, it keeps coming back and it lands on it. And when it does, the whole thing, kind of, the whole little branch just bends over until the pigeon has to fly off and it'll come back 30 seconds later and try it all again. The amazing thing is, like, like five metres that way, there's this enormous oak tree just the other side of our fence. It's about three times the height of our house, this mature oak tree that could easily support all of its weight. You know, many things in this world and in this life, they're a bit like those thin branches. They're, they're really not designed to support the weight of our deepest hopes and dreams and ambitions. The word of God and the promises of God are like the oak tree. You can, you can build your tree house of life in the oak tree of God's promise. It will never let you down. It will never fail you. No word from God will ever fail. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Shall we pray? Let's take a moment just in quiet. Just to um, talk to God, maybe if there's something particular that you feel God has spoken to you about tonight. Talk to him about that. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your wonderful gospel, that incredible announcement that Jesus is saviour and king. May we never lose the wonder of all of the implications of that for our lives. Refresh us and renew us in these truths. Would you help us to turn our eyes upon you, Lord Jesus? Would you help us to look you full in your wonderful face? Help us by the power of the Spirit that those things of earth may grow strangely dim. May we behold and be captivated by the light of your glory and grace. Amen. Let's stand together.
you as our saviour, the one who truly cleanses us, who washes away every past failure with his blood. We, we bow before you as our king, the king who knows our needs and meets them out of his own goodness and his own power. We turn our eyes to you and we see our sins taken away. We turn our eyes to you and we see hope in your eternal reign. And we are filled with joy that no word from you will ever fail. 
And we pray, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit and in his name. Amen. Thank you. Please take a seat. Now, for those who want to respond to what they've heard tonight, we have our prayer team who are available to pray with you. They are in the prayer space following this evening. And all you need to do is head through base camp there and you'll see them. They'll welcome you and they will pray with you. At home, if you have a prayer request and you'd like us to pray for you, then please do send your prayer requests to prayer at Keswick Ministries. Dot org. And tomorrow morning there's a prayer meeting at 8.45 a.m. here in this building. And it will also be live streamed so you can plug in wherever you are. So as we close this evening, let's all just pray together. Lord God, we thank you for richly blessing us with your word this evening. Please, Lord, just imprint the truth of what we've heard on our hearts Change us from inside out. Thank you for being our saviour and our forever king. We commit this evening to you now. In your precious son's name, amen. Thank you for being with us and we hope to see you tomorrow.
Full of sweet and bitter tears We have a Father We have a Father For our tracks through burning sands To our home in promised lands This hope God who shaped the earth and heavens your glory shines in all that you have made you spoke the word who broke into the darkness all earth replies majestic is your
join this song as all creation grows. Lord, haste the day, decay is slain.